turning our attention to Kalen DeBoer. Of course, one of the reasons, one of the pieces in these dominoes that are falling all from Nick Saban's retirement. Uh, there's a, there's basically like two ways to attack this as we're starting to see the hire come together. Um, you know, you, you go out there and you get Kane Womack, you know, sitting head coach at South Alabama. You go and get Maurice Lindquist, the sitting head coach at Buffalo to leave their positions to come be coordinators. We know that Ryan Grubb, you know, he's going to come and be the offensive coordinator in terms of a ball coach. You know, you're talking about like, okay, you're, you're assembling some, some coaches that have, you know, high reputations that have gotten a high mark. You also are maybe curious about what this does in terms of helping Kalen DeBoer and um, SEC recruiting, recruiting their own roster. Tom, do you think it, Let's go with the big picture first because the nitty gritty ties us to uh, our superstar transfer portal entry. Is it, as it has been suggested, a statement on the continued separation of power and also money, the fact that these coaches <clears throat> are leaving head coaching jobs to come be co-coordinators at Alabama? Yeah. Okay. It's it's a hundred. I mean. Look at the coaching cycles the last few years. Like we saw last year, Sean Lewis left the Kent State job to go be the offensive coordinator at Colorado. And part of that is just the money that's available at these schools. But even Colorado at the time didn't have like, you know, the kind of money that the SEC and the Big Ten have to put on coordinators. There's also the aspect that a lot of these head coaches at these smaller G5 programs feel like they have a better path towards a head coaching job at a larger school via being a coordinator at a larger school because if you look at the last few coaching cycles the power five jobs aren't hiring the up-and-coming group of five coaches anymore willie fritz was you know he he's he left Tulane and got the houston job but that was after two really good years and you look at john sumrall who in two years at troy wins two conference titles has a tremendous you know like that's a tremendous record for two seasons in years past the guy does that he's getting a power five job like when the, those jobs open it's like we got he has to take the Tulane job because, you know, the power five gigs that were open, they had some interest, but they didn't want to hire the Sun Belt coach because maybe they're looking at what's happening at Florida with Billy Napier. They're like, eh, I don't know. But whatever the case, we are seeing that these jobs, the money that is available, they're not nearly as comfortable in spending seven and a half million a year on a guy making 400 grand a year already. Like mm. you can't really justify that raise. So if you take the guy who's making 800 grand and give him seven or you, you give him a, a more commensurate raise with what he's like an, an actual kind of, you know, something sensible to like three and a half, four million, that's going to be used against him by other schools. And it's going to be used against them by agents. Like they don't pay their coaches. You don't want to go there. So it's kind of created its own economy to where with the coaches getting paid as much, it kind of limits the pools you're allowed to swim in to find your next coaching candidate. But then at the same time, it also affects how people look at their jobs. Like it used to be a status thing. Like I'm the head coach, but now the money is so ridiculous. It's like being the head coach isn't as important. I'm Kane Womack. I've got, I've done a pretty damn good job at South Alabama. I'm a head coach. I'd rather go be the defensive coordinator at Alabama because I'm going to get paid a ton more. Maurice Linguist, I'd rather go be a coordinator. Is, is he is Linguist actually getting a coordinator title? Because when I saw the news, it was a position coach. Oh, co, co, yeah, co. Okay, Womack, yeah, Womack and Linguist. But still, he's leaving a job as a head coach to be a co coordinator. Like things are drastically changing. In and Linguist this sport. might have been fired. Like he, Linguist was not trending in the right direction in the MAC. That, no, they did not have a great season. Yeah. yeah. I thought he was going to get fired. Yeah. But you, you didn't think that about Kane Womack. We've been looking no, at no. Kane Womack for years, and we've been like, hey, he's doing a great job at South Al. You got to look at South Al, a really well-coached team. I mean, to Tom's point, seven to eight years ago, he is on the path that you yes. take to go get a power conference job. And I agree with Tom that this is a faster track to a power conference job to go be a coordinator for Kalen DeBoer at Alabama. Billy Napier yeah. kind of screwed guys like John Summerall, right, and 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 dudes like that from getting you know top half SEC jobs or like top third Big Ten jobs. As we've seen with Indiana, you can still go Sun Belt to some of like the take the check, take the losses teams that aren't really competing for a Big Ten title. And like I think if, if Stoops had left Kentucky or something like that, I, I think a Summerall could have got Kentucky. But I think Napier is sort of the cautionary tale now. Like, eh, it's a different type of gig. It's a different type of responsibility. 
and we just can't trust you to make that leap. So I, I do think Billy costs a lot of those guys, given how it's going at Florida so far. And he can turn it around. We'll see. But I think largely what we're going to see is G5 coaches level up to ACC or Big 12 jobs, and then you jump from there to the more power two if you want to go with that, with a couple exceptions, obviously. Like some of the – like I think South Carolina or Mississippi State or a job like that could easily hire – you know, a Sunbelt coach and do really well. Also, there's there's the headache aspect of being a group of five head coach where you kind of oh, get yeah. to a point where you're like, what the hell am I even bothering doing this for? Because you'll recruit a player that, you know, kind of maybe flies under the radar, gets passed up by the bigger schools. You bring him into your program. You develop him. He has a good season. He's gone. Here comes the power five school says, hey, come here, come play for us. And the kid is leaving. So it's like – it's probably a somewhat hopeless situation for a lot of these guys where they feel like all the work they're doing is kind of for naught. So maybe they just rather go be a coordinator somewhere. There is no um, formula like to get to be a, you know, a, a SEC or big 10 coach. There's no indicator. I do think there's a recency bias um, that hurts some of these guys right now, as you guys are talking about Billy Napier, other ones put in there, Scott Frost, but there's also guys like Mike Norvell who's crushed it coming from Memphis you know, that then before him, it was Fuente who wasn't, you know, like there's just there's examples That's of every way. Yeah, exactly. There's examples both ways of successes and failures. But I do think the recent trend, I think it's more about the shift in college football and the money that's there and the resources and what you guys are talking about development. It is becoming like minor league baseball is the single A, double A, triple A to get to the NFL. And, you know, the SEC and Big uh, Big Ten are Triple A, one step away from the NFL. Yeah. You know, ACC and Big Twelve are kind of becoming Double A, and then you've got a lot of Group of Five teams at Single A. So if you're a Single A coach and you can make the jump to Triple A and be a coordinator, and you're a lot closer to being a Triple A head coach, I think you're going to do that. The other thing, did you guys see their salaries? Linquist is six seventy five as the head yeah. coach at Buffalo. He's probably doubling that. At Bama, Womack was eight fifty. He's making a significant raise, so like it's an easy decision for these guys. And you have to thread the needle, especially at Buffalo. Like, if are you going to win the MAC? And that's probably what you have to do to become a next head coaching candidate. South Alabama, you got to win consistently, or you go to Bama, and you're really close to winning the SEC. And you don't even have to win. You could be a playoff team, right? Which you're probably going to be no matter what. And then everybody's like, oh, look at this defense. Look at this great, you know, look at these guys. So I think it's all like what you guys are saying. I totally agree with. I think, too, like this is very much a long-term projection. But kind of like, you know, like a snow leopard whose population numbers are dwindling. G5 football is like on the endangered species list. The way things have changed in the last few years and the trends, that the, just the direction we're going, because things tend to speed up the further you get along. I just don't think it's going to be financially sensible for a lot of these schools to keep doing this in the future. I, th I think oh, that we're think, looking at a situation. You mean oh. shutting down the programs? I don't know if I'd say they shut down the programs, but maybe competing at this level. I think they're going to have their own championship. Yeah, I think they're going to have their own league is what I'm saying. I think it'll be good. I don't think I think that'll be good for them. I think it'll be healthy. I think there'll be more than enough money to go around to keep them going, but they're still going to get plucked. The best talent's going to get plucked. When they make us do eight shows a week instead of our normal amount, it'll be really good to have the second playoff and the second championship <laughs> to occupy our show schedule. <laughs>